Uh, uh, welcome to this uh, session of the Congress of Pragmatism. Um, we are part of a group of, uh, of research on pragmatism of, from the Univers Catholic University of, of Córdoba. And in the first place, um, Laura Hauber, that's, he, she's making he, her PhD in philosophy in, in, in Córdoba, will present um, his uh, paper. After that, um, Juan Manuel Serrea, also uh, from U National University of Córdoba and as a postdoc fellow, will present uh, his uh, paper. And finally, I, I will present uh, my, my talk. Uh, and after that, we will uh, have some time for, for questions and comments, uh, etc. Um, we we can start with uh, with with Laura first. Thank you, Professor. Bom dia, todo mundo. Obrigada pela presença. É, eu vou dar minha apresentação em inglês, mas eu tenho uma Bom, deixa eu começar. Well, let's um, start. My presentation is about John Dewey and the roots of everyday um, aesthetics. Um, introduction. In the last three decades, the discipline of everyday aesthetics has become increasingly prominent among thinkers, to the point of being considered by many an independent theoretical line with its own dilemmas, objects, problems, and philosophers, of course. Curiously, we could trace the origin of everyday aesthetics in two ways. One of them is to recognize the influence of the Japanese aesthetic theory, the Chinese and the Taoist philosophy, and also the substantial inspiration of the Zen Buddhist philosophy. Eastern aesthetics, unlike Western aesthetics, was much more concerned with everyday object actions and even behavior. So it's quite understandable that contemporary thinkers tend to those theories to find a basis for their own new everyday aesthetics. Another path of origin is to recognize the dialogue between everyday aesthetics and the European and American tradition of philosophy. Indeed, many scholars have traced three central figures of contemporary philosophy of the first half of the 20th century who were crucial, from continental philosopher Martin Heidegger, from analytic philosophy Ludwig Wittgenstein, and from the pragmatist philosopher, of course, John Dewey. Of those three philosophers mentioned, the most evident connections is with John Dewey and his pragmatism aesthetic theory. Indeed, almost all contemporary scholars of everyday aesthetics maintain some relation with Dewey, whether of approximation and approval, as in the case of Thomas Liddy, or as a criticism and overcoming, as in the example of Eureka Saito. Regardless of the position, Letty seems to be right in stating in a recently published article, and I quote his words here, Dewey is pretty much the grandfather of everyday aesthetic, end of quote. So the objective of the current presentation is to understand how Dewey operates the reinsertion of aesthetics in life and to what extent his proposals approach or differs from more contemporary everyday aesthetics theory. To reach the objective, the exposition was divided into three moments. In the first one, we sought to understand what the theory of contemporary everyday aesthetics is. Then we tried to understand the relation between this contemporary theory and the aesthetic proposals developed by Dewey in his aesthetic. Finally, we sought to understand to what extent Dewey's aesthetics theory can or cannot be read as part of the so-called aesthetics of everyday life. Let's just, well, let's start so from contemporary everyday aesthetics. 
Contemporary evidence aesthetics is a developed line of aesthetic theory that contemplates the possibility that aesthetic experience can be found in events, objects, and action that do not come from the world of fine arts. That is, it assess the possibility that there is a type of aesthetic experience that is part of and located directly in everyday life. The examples provided by these scholars are the most varied, from the mode we arrangement the objects in our house, or purchase choice for decoration, or enjoy a hot cup of tea, or the way we sit down to read a literary novel on the sofa on a quiet afternoon or even our willingness to face the activity of doing the laundry. Yuriko Said works a lot about uh, these aesthetics of doing laundry, for example. Those activities that are part of everyday life were not contemplated by the traditional modern aesthetic theory that such understand the aesthetic experience relate either to beauty or to art, but always given preference to a type of experience that was far from the ordinary. We can think that it was necessary to detach oneself from this everyday life, assuming a disinterested position to have an aesthetic experience. Such an experience so associated with art, however, seemed to be a rarity rather than a recurrence. In this sense, everyday aesthetics seeks to, seek to overcome those walls in Dewey's terms that have separated aesthetic from life. Choosing to broaden the understanding of what an aesthetic experience is and thus increasing our field of possibility to enjoy this experience. As Crispin Sartwell has well observed, everyday aesthetics originate from at least two facts, which you can add facts that are much debated in the world of contemporary art. The first is that the fine arts can emerge and relate to a series of activities that are not traditionally considered artistic or aesthetics. In this respect, it is enough to think of Duchamp and his anaesthetics, but nonetheless artistic objects. The second, and directly related to the first point, is about accepting the possibility that there are aesthetic stand behind the arts. It is the difference that we could mention between a philosophy of art oriented toward the artistic object and an aesthetic oriented toward a more varied range of experiences. Well, it seems no wonder that everyday aesthetics such as Yuriko Seito have suggested a return to a broader concept of aesthetics than the one current employ, which is almost synonymous with the philosophy of art. To this end, Saito suggests recovering the broad concept that had been proposed in the early days of the discipline by Alexander Bogartan, this putting back at the center of aesthetic theory its characteristic of the science of perception, much more than a way of art appreciation. Moreover, the proposal of everyday aesthetics also involves not only changing the more general concept of aesthetics, but also rethink what we mean by aesthetic experience and the components of such experience. Instead of the more traditional aesthetic experience that strike us or capture our attention, the aesthetic experience of everyday life seems to be marked by a kind of tranquility or a sense of familiarity, as Kalakuaka has noted. It's also possible, as Saito has, has observed, that it's constituted by action, much more than by passive appreciation. That is an experience that moves us toward a doing, such as cleaning or organizing, or even such a confused and non-described feeling as something's feel right. What lies behind this other view proposed by the aesthetic theory is the idea which, as we will see, was also present in Chong Dewey's pragmatist theory, that there is an aesthetic dimension in the life itself. Dewey speaks of aesthetic and germ, in this case, or as an aesthetic seed. In contrast, contemporary thinking of everyday aesthetic, we understand these aesthetics as fundamental. It is not necessarily the seeds for something else, but it's exactly what is presented, at least for some of those scholars. But here I'm getting to the heart of the paradox that exists in this everyday aesthetics theory. 
recently several scholars involved with the aesthetics of everyday since Thomas Liddy, Jen Percy, and Alan Carson have noted that there is what could be called to use Carson expression, a dilemma of everyday aesthetics. This impasse is nothing more than the problem of knowing to what extent we can deal with everyday aesthetic experience without transforming them into other extraordinary form of experience, cutting them out of ordinary life. And I quote here Lenin's words that present this dilemma. It would seem that we need to make some sort of distinction between the aesthetics of everyday life, ordinarily experienced, and the aesthetic of everyday life, extraordinarily experienced. However, any attempt to increase the aesthetic intensity of our ordinary everyday life experience will tend to push those experiences in the direction of the extraordinary. One can only conclude that there is a tension within the very concept of the aesthetics of everyday life. This tension is so profound in everyday aesthetics that the way philosophers have responded to it has created different methodologies for developing aesthetic theory. More particularly of interest here in, the, in this presentation is the fact that this methodological difference can also be read as crucial distinction in interpreting John Dewey's pragmatist aesthetics theory. This is because on one hand, scholars like Saito and Arthur Hapala understand that everyday aesthetics should take everyday experience as paradigmatic without pushing them into an extraordinary interpretation, which resembles the way as art is treated. In this case, for example, Saito developed a critique of Dewey's theory because she considers, and I quote here her words, still too restrictive. Ultimately, according to the Japanese philosopher, Dewey still maintains the difference and tension between aesthetic experience and everyday experience. And when dealing with everyday life, he used terms such as enemy of aesthetics. In contrast, philosophers, for philosophers like Liddy and also Shuri Irvin, the aesthetics of everyday approaches ordinary objects in an extraordinary way, pushing them toward an experience that can be similar to what of the work of art. In this case, the contemporary scholars seated chair with Dewey, a certain theory that understands the possibility that the ordinary and the artistic are on the same line, being only a distinction of degrees. In general, if something has caught our attention, if it's something ordinary, it has some degree of extraordinary. So this interpretative difference from Dewey's theory seems to be at least an indication of how deep the link between classical pragmatism aesthetics theory and everyday aesthetics is. Russell Preva in a recent publication considers everyday aesthetics as a summit and some aesthetics also as a subset of pragmatist aesthetics. In short, whether to agree or disagree, do is a key figure that almost all contemporary scholars have taken up in their formulations of everyday aesthetics. For this reason, in the next section, we move to move on to examine more properly Dewey's aesthetics theory and its relationship with everyday life. Um, so, as will become evident in this section of the conference, the links between the contemporary strands of everyday aesthetics and John Dewey's aesthetics theories are deep. A curious fact that seems to somehow sign this proximity is that many of the scholars who developed this line have worked with Dewey's aesthetics at some point in their careers. In fact, any reader minimally familiar with Dewey's aesthetic philosophical project we will find an obvious nexus between the two elements. When he only opened his book of aesthetic artist experience, and we find already in the second paragraph the statement that his project intended, and I quote Dewey here, to restore continuity between the refined and um, intensified forms of experience that are works of art and the everyday events, doings, and sufferings that are universally recognized to constitute experience. Thus, the reconnection between art and life, and more specifically, between the fine arts and our everyday experience, is at the heart of Dewey's aesthetics. The philosopher takes pains to argue in the more than 300 pages of the work that is not necessary. Uh, 
period. Can you? Can you... Se, te, se te fue la conexión, Laura, un, un, un par de segundos. De los últimos 40 segundos, más o menos, Laura. Eh. ¿Sigo o vuelvo? <risas> de, de, no, no, a, ahí me parece que está la... Este, empezá, o sea, con, empezá desde el principio de la otra, me parece que... ¿De esa? No, a ver. Bueno, desde, el, desde ahí... Desde el, the, the last paragraph of this the last uh, paragraph. page. Yes. Does the reconnection? Does the reconnection? Ah, okay. Does the reconnection between art and life, and more specifically between the fine arts and our everyday experience, is at the heart of Dewey's aesthetics. The philosopher takes pain to argue in the more than 300 pages of the work that it's not necessarily natural for there to be a break between those two spheres, but that it's a break has an history external to the reasons of the artwork or aesthetic theory. More precisely, do we sought to argue that aesthetic experience differ from everyday experience only in the degree of completeness, but they did not necessarily have a distinct nature. This is to say the philosophers strive to show that there is a possible continuity between life and aesthetic experience, and that at least in theories, the element that make of an aesthetic experience, an aesthetic experience can be found in different places. And this is where tension begin to arise in his theory. As Nike Pope has noted, although Dewey seems to be sensitive to the possibility of popular art or everyday aesthetic experience, he does not seem to have embraced this possibility when writing his work. This tension is evident, especially when despite signaling to a broader aesthetic theory, Dewey goes on to assert that works of art, and I quote, exemplifies in an accentuated and perfected manner the union characters of many other experiences, end of quote. Already, in another significant passage, Dewey states that, and I quote, the sense of the including whole implicit and ordinary experience is rendered intense with the frame of painting or poem, end of quote. This constant tension is, was also noted by Saito, who criticized Dewey for giving preference to the experience of the works of fine arts. Despite his initial speech of expanding aesthetic experience and reconnecting art and daily life, evidence of his preference of Dewey pointed out by Saito is that his examples in the book all come from the fine arts, especially the poetry of Keats, Shelley, and Woodward, or the paintings of Leonardo, Dure, El Greco, Cezanne, Matisse, and Vagal. At several points in the book, Dewey contrasts the experience of everyday life and the aesthetic experience of the arts, where, whereas the arts are treated in terms of aesthetics experience marked by a certain rhythm, attention, completeness, and complexion, distinct emotional content, and continuity. The experience of everyday life, or by contrast, marked by an inattention and discontinuity. At one point, the philosopher states that, and I quote, Ordinary experience is often infected with apathy, latitude, and stereotype. We get neither the impact of quality through sense, nor the meaning of things through thought." End of quote. This tension could also be translated in terms of the tensions that contemporary aesthetics seems to deal with in the aesthetics of every day. On the one hand, as in the senses of and developed by Letty, Dewey seems to recognize that the ordinary things of every day can develop in something extraordinary. And it's possible to recognize in the arts a pattern to which we can compare. A passage that supports these interpretations can be found in quotes like this, and quote Dewey here. Even a crude experience, if authentically unexperienced, is more fit to give a clue to the intrinsic nature of that experience than is an object already set apart from any other mode of experience. Following this clue, we can discover how the work of art develops and accentuates what is characteristic valuable in things of everyday enjoyment. The art product will then be seen to issue from the later when the full meaning of ordinary experience is expressed. As dice come out of cold, tar products when they receive special treatment. End of quote. 
Firstly, do we seem sometimes also to adopt a position that could be read more closely with Saito, that everyday experience which objects, but also with gesture, actions, and relationships can be a source of aesthetic experience without having to be compared to the arts. This is evident, especially in a lecture delivered by Dewey entitled The Philosophy of the Arts, where we can read that. Unfortunately, there is a tendency when we think of works of art primarily to associate them with the art museums, the art galleries, or the music hall or opera house, places where we can go and see or hear those objects which have become recognized as work of art. If we approach the matter from our end, we get a more flexible approach and one that is more inclusive, one that's more tolerant. It recognizes that we may have this experience in the presence of all kinds of things. The greatness of a person approaching intercourse in relation to other people, that great deeds of people, not merely of those who are recognized as heroes, but humble people, may then have the grace or nobility because of the way they strike us. If we approach from this side, it seems to me that it tends to enlarge us. If we become more on the lookout for the moments of this kind of experience, we do not think of them as experience we have to have by going to certain places, but that we may have at any time of day in connection with any, not everyone, but with contact to objects, scenes, persons that are not in any way labeled to be works of fine art and of cult. We see here that in a certain sense, the so-called dilemma of everyday aesthetics can already be found in the tension existing in John Dewey's pragmatist aesthetic theory, which sometimes tend to consider ordinary experience as a really valid source of aesthetic experience, and sometimes understands them as a starting point in contrast with the works of art and admitting that it's necessary to transform the ordinary into extraordinary. Conclusion. Before closing this talk, I'd like to make a few observations. Unfortunately, the dilemma was not solved either by Dewey or by the thinkers of contemporary everyday aesthetics. Perhaps it's not possible to solve it, or perhaps we just need to keep insisting and developing this theory since it's a very recent line of thought. After all, even very recent everyday subjects receive no attention to make them extraordinary or not. As you might imagine, I have no pretense to solve this paradox here, Perhaps my presentation is more properly an attempt to re revisit Dewey's aesthetic test in search of inspiration to deal with this dilemma. In a way, taking a position or another actually implies an adoption of a certain methodology to treat aesthetic experience. And in the current circumstance of the debate, both have advantage, advantage and disadvantage. My exposition today was an attempt to show here especially that this paradox is not a novelty, exactly. He was already present even before the everyday aesthetic theory has, uh, was consolidated as a theoretical investigative line. Somehow, Dewey seems to be conscious and oscillate between the two response poles and able to decide on one of the ways. Perhaps I'm in, I am inclined to accept Dewey's position developed by Liddy that it is impossible to do with ordinary things without, to some extent, do it to our methodology and also our attention, make them extraordinary. Nonetheless, if you do was right and those well-developed aesthetic experience help us to communicate better with others and to live more fully, perhaps making things a little more extraordinary is just what we need in this difficult post-pandemic moment. Thank you. Eh, bueno, eh, we eh, thank you, Laura, for the presentation, and after that is the time from Juan Manuel Sarrea eh, and he, his presentation. Eh, Juan. Okay. Thank Claudio. I would like to to thank the organization. I would like to thank Adriana, Ivo. Uh, it is a pleasure to, to be part of this international uh, meeting on pragmatism. Bon dia is the only expression in Portuguese that I, I know. Uh, so the, the title of, of my, my talk is What are the real implications of an experimental education? 
the place of propositional knowledge in Dewey's educational uh, theory. Uh, I would like to start mentioning that possible the concept of propositional uh, knowledge um, is not appropriate to analyze Dewey's work. Uh, the idea of propositional knowledge is associated with propositional logic, as you know. Moreover, it is an idea that became relevant long after Dewey wrote his most, uh, his most relevant text in philosophy of education. However, Dewey uses the expression propositional forms for the first time uh, in the problem of truth, and he uses it also in has, uh, the, the, the expression propositional logic in a later, later essay, characteristics and characters, kind and classes. Okay? What is the plan uh, for this uh, presentation? Uh, firstly, to point out that Dewey does not consider propositional knowledge to play a relevant role in experimental education. Uh, secondly, to defend that this could imply a problem, since the role of propositional knowledge in education is unquestionable. And uh, finally, to offer uh, a, a reply would be to this objection by appealing to Dewey's conception about practical normativity. What is my starting point? Well, one of the challenges to reassess properly Dewey's experimentalism in education is to elucidate the relationship between experimentalism and propositional knowledge. Uh, this is because learning by doing, okay, another way to speak about experimentalism, involves that the main objective in education would be to obtain non-propositional knowledge, that is, abilities, skills, competences, and so on. Currently, however, educational system is supposed to highlight propositional knowledge. For understand this last idea uh, is uh, necessary uh, to ask what is propositional knowledge, or to delimitate the idea of propositional knowledge. Uh, propositional knowledge is a case of knowledge, obviously, articulated in terms of propositions. Uh, in an educational context, propositional knowledge comes as the effect of teacher's testimony, okay? The idea of testimony, in this technical sense, comes uh, from uh, uh, social epistemology, okay? Uh, the idea is, I come to know that something is the case because someone else tells me that something is the case, okay? So, testimony mm, is a, a source of knowledge. An example of propositional knowledge in an educational context would be, uh, this is an example from a, a contemporary philosopher of education, David Wadhurst, uh, who is a neo-pragmatist philosopher of education, and he uh, holds, consider Jamie a grade nine student who today learned the following at the school from his English teacher that Jane Austen published six novels, from his biology, biology textbook that the structure of DNA molecule is a double helix. Okay? The um, expressions in bold are examples of propositional knowledge. Uh, bearing this uh, in mind, um, it is necessary now to delimitate the idea of experimentalism in Dewey's work. As you know, Dewey ponders the different implications of the concept of experimentalism in many texts. Uh, his conception of experimentalism is frequently related to both epistemology and political philosophy. Regarding uh, epistemology, we could mention studies in logical theory, insights in experimental logic, the quest for certainty, and logic, a theory of inquiry. Regarding political philosophy, we could mention liberalism and social action, where the, the idea of experimentalism and his linking with social reform is, uh, is connected, okay? However, we will focus 
or my interest is in education. And texts about experimentalism, experimentalism in education are mainly, mainly three. The first one, democracy and education. As you remember, Dewey says in the preface of democracy and education that he will connect the growth of democracy with the development of the experimental methods, uh, evolutionist ideas and the industrial reorganization. Uh, secondly, experience and education, one of uh, Dewey's educational texts in later works, probably the, the most important one. And finally, uh, how we think that this, according to our perspective, the most important uh, or one of the most important or relevant texts in uh, philosophy of education in the middle works, okay? Uh, mainly uh, his first edition in 1910. Well, why do we focus on how we think? Okay, there are two reasons, and a conceptual or an analytical reason that is, even though do it mentions and highlights the links between experimentalism and education in his most relevant educational text, we could mention also, for example, the the public uh, and the, the school and society, uh, the argumentative core of how we think is grounded on these relationships. Okay, and there is also a historical reason. Before 1908, 1909, Dewey does not recognize himself as a pragmatist, but from the billions of pragmatism upon education, he does. A crucial reason for this change was the relevance that the ties of pragmatism and anthropology had for Dewey. And one characteristic future of this pragmatist anthropology was, was the experimentalist perspective about the mind and knowledge. An additional historical reason is that this is the period immediately after the experience of the laboratory school. Okay, Dewey is writing, thinking about uh, his experience um, in the laboratory school. Okay, so from the middle works, I take the years that goes from the experience of pragmatism uh, until we could say uh, democracy and education and I focus in how we think. Uh, based on this, what is experimentalism in education? Okay, um, we could say that the starting point hmm, of how we think is that experimentation is a natural tendency particularly visible uh, in play or spontaneous activities, okay? In the variants of pragmatism upon education, Dewey had already pointed out that every educative process should begin with doing something. Presently, because it is an action, uh, in action uh, where is a spontaneity and interest flow. In this sense, the attitude of childhood is really important to understand uh, an idea of uh, some clue of unity, as we say, for the curricula, okay? In how we think he uh, uh, holds. This book also represents the conviction that the native and unspoiled attitude of childhood, marked by ardent curiosity, fertile imagination, and love of experimental inquiry, is near, very near, to the attitude of the scientific mind. Um, chapter three of how we think, in fact, is precisely entitled Natural Resources in the Training of Thought. The Dewey posits that educating is to adjust certain natural, natural psychological processes to a scientific way of thinking. Okay? He later says education takes the individual while he is relatively plastic. The attitude of childhood is naive wandering, experimental, the world of man and nature is new. And he concludes, right methods of education preserve and perfect this attitude. As a consequence of this uh, reflection, do we propose as a method of learning to promote reflective thought? Uh, it is constituted by active, persistent and careful consideration of any belief or supposed form of law of knowledge in the light of the grounds that support it and the further conclusions to which it tends. 
famous, famously, Dewey uh, describes reflected thought through five steps, okay? The first one is a felt difficulty in the environment. Um, this is at the level we could say at the perception. I, I see a feel, felt difficulty that caught my attention. Then his, its location and definition. Uh, third, suggestion of possible solution. In the fourth place, development by reasoning of the variance of the suggestion. Here, uh, reasoning is taken in the sense of a practical reason, okay? And finally, further observ observation and experimental leading to its acceptance or rejection, that is, the conclusion of beliefs or disbeliefs. Considering this uh, picture, we could, oh, I, I would like to uh, make uh, a set of, con of consideration on reflected thought. Uh, one, implicit in this characterization is the pragmatist conception of beliefs as a habit of action. This is an idea that uh, Claudio suggests to me, and I think that he is right, okay? This is a uh, way to uh, reconstruct a pragmatist conception of belief. Uh, then the process summarizes an attitude whose steps in practice occur in an overlapping manner, okay? It's not a physic, fixed um, a set of, 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 or a fixed process, okay? Within this process, even when reason, reasoning takes place, the goal is a course of action. Finally, there is practically no incidence of propositional knowledge in this uh, process of reflected thought. In conclusion, experimental methods, scientific method of experimentation, experimental thinking, or also, uh, there is a mistake in, in the old, or also active or experimental method, okay, understood as a clue of unity or centralized factor for the curricula, okay, uh, does not consider the role of propositional knowledge, okay. Uh, considering this, I would like to pose a, a, a question, okay? The absence on the one half of a role for propositional knowledge might be a problem in Dewey's experimentalism. It could be thought that even propositional knowledge is necessary to carry out an active education, at least in certain cases. For example, the teacher needs to uh, define a concept before doing certain activity, okay? So, could do we give an answer to this sort of objection? Okay, I think that he does. If we uh, take in, into consideration to his conception of language, do we devote, in fact, a chapter, the, the chapter thirteen of how we think to analyzing uh, how language impacts on education? Okay. This chapter is called Language and the Training of Thought, and the first section is named Language as the Tool of Thinking. Okay, he renamed in 1933, in the reedition of how we think, this section has language has a, um, oh, the education is medium to, uh, to uh, or for the thinking to become, a, 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 we can say, a, or the role of education is to, uh, to that the language became a intellectual factor, okay? And, and he, in that case, distinguishes between a civil use of language and, a, in, and an intellectual use of language, okay? But I'm not interested in this moment to uh, address this distinction, but in brief, do we address or deal with the uh, issue of language in a specific chapter? However, he does not directly deal with the issue of the role of propositional knowledge. But do he links language with an idea of practical normativity? Okay? Angel Faerna reconstructs this idea as follows. In Dewey, linguistic normativity, propositional normativity, we could say also, arises from a practical normativity, that is, reflected thought, that develops primarily. 
This has to do with Dewey's naturalism and his conviction that human language does not make a substantial difference in relation to non-linguistic creatures. Okay? Now, if we consider that this thesis about language, or if we consider this thesis, there is an empirical hypothesis related to the place of propositional knowledge in education that emerged. This is the hypothesis, or the hypothesis as follows. Possible propositional knowledge is relevant as a centralizing factor or clue of unity for the curricula during high school. Okay? On the contrary, reflected thought should predominate during school, the first years of, of uh, uh, ed educational system. Thus, propositional and non-propositional knowledge would be relevant at two different stages of formal education. There are two implications connected with this hypothesis. The first one is that concentrating schooling on propositional knowledge okay, would be, according to Dewey and an experimentalist, pointless. Okay, because in this stage, uh, the most important um, factor in education is a certain attitude that fits with a non-propositional um, uh, pedagogy, we could say. And the second one is that reducing secondary, oh, sorry, <laughs> there is a, a, a mistake. I, reducing high school, okay, to mere technical training, that is non-propositional knowledge, prevents the consolidation of linguistic normativity. Okay, do we think in also in the role of language has linguistic normativity in, in this stage of the uh, education system. To sum up, in this talk, I have attempted to offer an answer to what place propositional knowledge has in Dewey's approach, okay? It is possible to think of, of such an articulation, although empirical research is required to elucidate uh, the issue. Okay, thanks. Claudio, it's your turn. Thanks, thanks. Uh, thanks uh, Juan. Uh, I will uh, start with my uh, presentation. Um, uh, uh, sorry. Um, Um, so uh, you can can is uh, the is the, of the presentation okay? I can see the presentation. Uh, ah, Claudia. Okay. Um, now. Now I can see the, the presentation. Okay. It's okay. Well, um, my presentation is called um, Pragmatism and Method, Classical and Contemporary Variations. Uh, this is a part of uh, a paper where I am writing it, uh, with Juan. Uh, that's is uh, called pragmatism and methods and historical and conceptual uh, approach. Um, in in this paper, we we will uh, attempt to do some things. Uh, first, to um, reconstruct the vision of classical pragmatism as its conception of method. Uh, after that. A reflection of experience, method, and the linguistic uh, term. Uh, then, um, um, reconstruction of uh, neo pragmatism and, and, and method. 
And finally, the most important part of, of the paper is the, the, the scope of the conception of method, uh, philosophy, social theory, and, and, and education. Um, the, oh, our hypothesis uh, first is that uh, there are three forms to, to define uh, pragmatism. Uh, the first one is uh, an, an strict uh, that's appealed to, to uh, the, the method uh, as a meaning. Uh, the method to make our ideas clear, a method uh, linked with through, and, met and methods to dissolve uh, met metaphysical uh, disputes. This is um, the, this in this case we we uh, the um, usually the author who define pragmatism pragmatism in this way look for a strictly criterion to, to define a, a pragmatism. Uh, there, there is also a broad uh, way to define pragmatism that has to do with uh, some future that, for example, Morris, Stan Morris and Richard Reinstein uh, has established. For example, uh, the pragmatism is um, a compromise with uh, fallibilism, anti-sexism, the uh, a compromise with the social dimension of self, with Darwinism, and also with uh, defense of uh, democracy. In this way, the, the, the pragmatism is defined as a tradition, uh, more that to look for a specific criterion to, to define it. And, and there is also a discussion of uh, after Richard Rorty's uh, philosophy of pragmatism, uh, we should define pragmatism uh, for the appellation to a method or, or not, that is uh, pragmatism without me method. Um, our idea that uh, Juan is also uh, has presented uh, uh, um, in the some clue in the in the last um, talk is that the more important way to define pragmatism is through anthropology. Um, and it's, I, I would add specifically to uh, uh, Dewey's view of uh, education. Um, this is very important to, to keep this in, in, in mind. Um, so in this part of the paper, we refer to, to historically to Charles Pierce and his very novel idea of, of his uh, reflection uh, of, of method, uh, William James uh, and John Dewey, uh, the methods for all of them uh, play a crucial role for, uh, for philosophy. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, Peirce, uh, the um, fixation of belief is uh, with the, 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 the method play a role to, to fix the belief and, and, and knowledge different way to, to do it. That, that is uh, well known in, in literature. Uh, also with uh, how to make our ideas clear in with the relation to the pragmatic maxim. Uh, there's a, a method for clarify uh, meaning. And for James in, in pragmatism, the uh, method is uh, a way to resolve uh, metaphysical disputes or also a theory of truth. This, this is if well known the difference between um, Pierce and James uh, regarding the, the scope of, of method. Uh, and in the case of Dewey, that is, or that is the core of our presentation, uh, is the method is linked with uh, uh, education. Um, well, is this is I um, the 
anthropology and the anthropology of pragmatism uh, linked with education is is the, is for us the way to the more promising way to define uh, pragmatism. Uh, so uh, is uh, for us uh, pragmatism should be defined. Um, uh, taking in account this this um, feature features that uh, uh, Bernstein and Morris uh, stress, um, but uh, in a in a strict way that is not uh, the appellation the traditional criteria that uh, appellate to a, or, or to the theory of true or to the theory of meaning uh, etc. No. Uh, and the the way to to do that is from to philosophy and the link of philosophy anthropology and social theory there are two neo pragmatist authors that are very important for our argumentation are one of them is richard rorty and the other one is uh, hans uh, joas for different reasons um, Regarding uh, Rorty and, and, and Yui, we have uh, written a, a paper with uh, Juan Ferrer that is called Pragmatism and, and Me Pragmatismo Metodo y Educación, Yui y Rorty acerca de how we think. That is Pragmatism Method and Education, Yui and Rorty and how we think, uh, published the last, the last uh, year. Uh, we also write a paper in from uh, the Pragmatist Turn, Introduction to the Vision of Pragmatism Upon Education, that's uh, published in Topicos, in uh, that's a, a journal of Argentina. Um, and also an introduction of, of Dewey's uh, of this paper that is in Spanish is Las Implicancias del Pragmatismo para la Educación. Um, the or in, in in all this paper are, are the uh, as a ground for that we uh, want uh, attempt to make or will attempt to make in in, in this new paper that is the the relation between method and and, and and education and for definition of of, of philosophy uh, regarding this in this uh, Rorty says the, the, the following to make to make this criticism of uh, how we think a, 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 a very important uh, book of, of, of Dewey as Juan has said is not to cast doubt on Dewey's goals nor on his claim that something new and important came into in war with Bacon and the new science it is only to cast doubt upon his attempt to identify this new thing with a way of thinking, as opposed to some concrete suggestion about new hypotheses to try out, and upon his attempt to promote the goals he shared by an appeal to a putatively descriptive, ideologically neutral discipline called psychology or logic. That attempt should be viewed as an unfortunate, unfortunate after effect of the 19th century philosophical vocabularies on which Dewey was raised, vocabularies which suggest that the nature of judgment of reasoning or of thought or of science were suitable topic for philosophical research. And post quotation. Um, this uh, I will contrast this with a quotation of Dewey's, one of Dewey's famous uh, paper that is called The Postulate of Immediate Empiricism. Uh, from the postulate of empiricism, then, or what is the same thing from a general consideration of the concept of experience, nothing can be deduced, not a single philosophical proposition, not a single pro philosophical proposition. The reader may else conclude that all this just come from the truism that experience is experience or is what it, it is. 
If one attempts to draw conclusions from the bare concept of experience, the reader is quite right. But the real significance of the principle is that of a method of philosophical analysis, a method identical in kind, but different in problem and hence in operation with that of the scientist. If you wish to find out that subjective, objective, physical, mental, cosmic, psychic, cause, substance, purpose, activity, evil, brain, quality, any philosophical term in short means go to the experience and see what the thing is experienced as. This is from the postulate of immediate empiricism. This, uh, and now I, I quote some thing of the beginning of pragmatism upon education. And after that, I made a connection between, between them. In this paper uh, from 1908, 1909, um, Dewey said the following. I now touch briefly upon the beginnings of this, this conception of mind upon the question of educational method, reserving for a later paper its reading upon the subject matter of study and upon the social and moral basis and aim of schools. One, every educative process should begin with doing something and the necessary training of same perception, memory, imagination, and judgment to grow out of the condition and the need that of what is being done. Second, sense training would inevitably result from engage in these various, various activities. The boy who plays marble and ball, the girl who dress and undress her doll and make clothes for her, get a training of the sense which is all the more effective because it is incidental to the current on of some line of action and is not set, set up as a special task or end in itself. And uh, finally, three, the more intellectual side of education, the store of general ideas and principle, the requisition of habits of reflection and deliberation should be placed on the same basis. All thinking at its outset is planning, forecasting, forming purpose, selecting a, a range of means for the most economical and successful realization. Comparatively little opportunity is afforded in our present school system for the practical activities which are necessary to develop this type of thought. Uh, one of the um, one of the paragraphs of the paper we made with Juan said the following. It was in Spanish, but I translate to English. For all the above, in short, it is possible to avoid the rotten conclusion that the Dewan method is nothing more than a secular battering ram against the still influential presence of theology. Instead, the method is a contribution to provide a general idea of learning as a hypothesis to an educational theory that can be extended and reconfigurated in the light of new data. Okay, end of quotation. Um, the point for, for, for me in, in, and for this paper that we are doing is, is, is the following is, uh, the idea of method in, 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 Dewey, in Dewey is not that uh, Dewey is, uh, oh, sorry, Rorty is, is saying, but um, it's a way to handle with, with the reality through the, um, the conception of experience, but the, the philosophical method and also the method in, in education are um, intimately, intimately connected. And for, for that, and both are connected with uh, Dewey's view of human being. To carry out this task is, in, is 
necessary to see this um, from a philosophical point of view, this uh, the production of view in the first decade of the 19th century, uh, when when he uh, and, uh, recognize, recognize himself uh, in the movement of pragmatism, in particular in this text we, we, uh, that we have translated, that is the um, building of pragmatism upon education, or in Spanish, um, the Las implicancias del pragmatismo para la educación. Thank you. Well, um, I, I uh, finish the presentation. Uh, we give space for some, some questions. I have questions for both of you, but I, I, I hope that for, for another so assistant. If, if there, no, no sé si hay otra pregunta, si le quieren hacer en, en, en portugués, no hay problema. Laura, vos puedes traducir también en todo caso. Y si no hay ninguna pregunta, este, lo dejamos el espacio para... Vale, podés hacerlo vos, Juan, y, y en todo caso está bien. Eh, Juan, ¿do you want to make a question? Or? Eh, yes, I do. Yeah. I, I would like to eh, ask Laura, what are the eh, most important... Eh, opponents of John Dewey's uh, uh, aesthetics in contemporary aesthetic thinking. I, I think that you said something about this topic, but I would like to uh, uh, speak more about this, uh, this, um, this, this point because uh, I'm interested, I, I don't know uh, much more about uh, Dewey's aesthetics, but I, I cannot see what, what is the um, the problem with us uh, to accept the idea that there is something like a uh, everyday aesthetics okay but i think for uh, a lot of philosophers this idea is uh, really um, difficult to accept okay so i would like to that you mention some authors or some trends in in contemporary philosophy that rejects the idea of a everyday uh, aesthetics, okay? Um, that is uh, my question uh, for, for Laura. Um, if you let me, Claudio, I would like to, uh, uh, to leave one question or comment for you. Uh, that is that, uh, what is the, um, uh, for you, what is the, uh, the, the principal or the major objection uh, related to this delimitation of pragmatism, uh, oh. because um, for I think that many uh, might think that well, it's not necessary to delimitate uh, the central idea for pragmatism because there are many pragmatists has uh, trends uh, in contemporary philosophy. There is this image about the corridor, okay, with mm. many, okay. Yes. So what is the what is the, the the sense to delimitate pragmatism? I I, I know that you have this uh, uh, this uh, uh, answer for this question, but mm. I would like that you make explicit this yeah, okay. this point. Okay, okay. thanks. Um, I suppose I should start and. I'm not sure I understood what you mean with um, Dewey's enemy and contemporary aesthetics, um, because Dewey is an enemy from his own time. There's a lot of enemies in which he's talking or trying to talk with. And contemporary aesthetics has a lot of oppositors, because, well, it's, of course, very clear how it's problematic to treat some like 
or everyday experience as and kind of aesthetic experience, but are engaged. And even Schusterma, for example, or Saito, because there is a lot of um, a different type to think about what is an aesthetic experience. And much for me, at least for what I'm reading, there is um, this difference in backgrounds because when we or when it depart from classic modern European aesthetics is of course a problem. But if we change our backgrounds and we start thinking and depart from Japanese aesthetics or Chinese aesthetics where didn't have properly an academic discipline for many, many, many years, but have a think about um, aesthetics. And this thing is mainly concerns about everyday things and everyday actions and everyday behavior and how this impacts society. Think about Chinese Confucian, Confucian um, thinking. So it's, I think it's about replace or trying to depart from another point. And then, I don't know if you know Zen Buddhist philosophy, but with Shusrima for me, it's very good in this point because when we treat everyday's experience in this line of Zen Buddhist philosophy, everything could be an aesthetic experience because we have attention with everything. We have care with everything. We are interested in everything. It's a different way to be in the world. So I don't know. I think it. we can think about it, this, but we need to expand our, our backgrounds. Um, I regarding the definition of, of pragmatism, uh, it's true that uh, William James, for example, with this uh, metaphor of corridor, is uh, said well. Okay, there is a different, there is a pluralism, uh, but there is a a point that uh, all the people who call himself pragmatism should agree that this is the method. Uh, so the corridor is if is the method, uh, but um, after that, uh, on, it was um, uh, uh, yeah, in, and in the present, for example, this uh, this is also a, a discussion in between. Uh, the Mason or and the Persian about what is what pragmatism is, but and there are yeah, uh, also uh, this discussion or this this way to define pragmatism through uh, this feature that uh, Bernstein and Morris uh, summarize that is uh, fallibilism and etc. Etc. This is this. Uh, if you share some of this feature, uh, you are a pragmatist. For me, uh, the this both are uh, wrong in a way uh, because this is not um, uh, not the the, the most uh, clever way to define pragmatism. The, the core of pragmatism for me uh, uh, and for others, for some of us, uh, is uh, an, an um, anthropology view, an, an, an anthropological view, the, the, the human being as an uh, active being, as um, a, and all the other things associated with pragmatism, the, the, the 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 definition of belief the um, um, for example uh, or the conception of belief on the on the conception of action are uh, grounded on this uh, explicitly or implicitly in this in in, in this view with this we um, not commit the mistake to for, for example, some authors say, well, uh, 
uh, Dewey don't apply uh, the pragmatic maxim to education if he's not, uh, there is no pragmatism there. Uh, this, uh, uh, this is the advantage for me to define pragmatism in, from in the anthropological view to, to, to avoid uh, ambiguity in to regarding to the futures or avoid uh, uh, avoid to uh, views that are very strange to define pragmatism. This is, I think, this is the, the two risks risk that we avoid the appealing to anthropology. Can I comment on, on your comment? On, me, on my comment. Okay. Yes, of course. I, I, I ask this uh, uh, for this clarification because I think that, in, uh, yes, in fact, the, the, the main idea that we could uh, uh, we could attribute to a pragmatist tradition is a sort of uh, anthropology, um, and I think that this uh, anthropology has an impact in meta philosophy. Or, I mean, has uh, you well, we we will we have discussed about this point, but nowadays in analytical philosophy. Um, uh, has been uh, or is uh, being recovered uh, a naturalism in the wave of Dewey's post uh, the idea of a continuity, for example, uh, non creatures, uh, non linguistic creatures, and uh, linguistic creatures. Uh, so, Richard Bernstein, in his uh, last uh, book published in 2020, he sustained the idea of um, a naturalism uh, has um, a naturalism of second nature, for example, that is an expression of a neo pragmatist uh, has John McDowell. It's an idea that was present 50 years or 60 years ago uh, in John Dewey's philosophy. So mm -hmm. that is John Dewey's legacy and of other philosophers that were written with Dewey in, in those times. Okay, and I think that this point is really important, considering the debate about uh, the dichotomy between a pragmatist of method and a pragmatist mm -hmm. of language. Because, mm -hmm. for example, uh, uh, Robert Brandon thinks that the message of pragmatism is better understood through analytic uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote this book about uh, uh, pragmatism and neo pragmatism and he sustains that Dewey well he Dewey was good but uh, was right about uh, the, the idea of practical normativity for example but he uh, doesn't understand the um, the demarcation question about the incidence uh, of language in our comprehension uh, but the I think that the the, the core message of do is naturalist. Um, te, te fue la señal, me parece. Bueno. Um, um, se le... Uh, Juan is out of line. I don't know what uh, what is uh, what uh, happens, but um, uh, if there is no more question, we finish the the presentation here. I don't know. Oh. Huh? No, Luca. I don't know. Ah, Juan, te había, eh, you were out of line for. Uh, okay, I for think that my, conne minutes. my connection is unstable. I think that okay. my, probably my, my, my video was frozen, but uh, I'm yes. here now. Okay. I'm here now. <laughs> okay. Well, in, in brief, the idea is I think that uh, the, the anthropological conception that you um, 
you, you mentioned or delimitate in pragmatism has meta philosophical uh, uh, impacts that are, are really insightful in the actual debate about uh, which pragmatism uh, we we prefer or is better or we we pragmatism uh, captures better the message about class classical pragmatism and regarding the comment uh, uh, from from Laura um, I was thinking when I asked the question that probably uh, there is a, a tendency in analytic philosophy to associate uh, aesthetic analysis with uh, critical um, uh, analysis of, of uh, critical uh, art. Critical, critical art. Yes. And I think that there are other tendency. It's like a sort of sociological uh, um, factor in the preferences. Okay, probably for a critic of art, the idea of a everyday aesthetic is pointless. But for uh, uh, people who uh, reivindicate, for example, uh, cultural or popular art, is really a uh, a good framework or that of do is to defend the idea of popular art or something like, like that. I'm, I'm not sure it's pointless because, for example, Saito saw, saw in, says in her book that it's not about it's being against art or art theory or philosophy of art. It's about expand the limits of aesthetics. It's about to recognize that here we look a lot about art and objects of art and this kind of thing but there is also other possibilities and well do do we will sign sign up for this but it's not enough in her opinion so we need to continue to dig in in this that that's my point that yes they recognize many of them for example lady also works like critical theory of art it's in despite the fact it's a kind of pragmatist because he specializes in zoo aesthetics also but i don't i don't think we need to do like this dualism <laughs> in a do a, do a way we can do both like everyday aesthetic and critical of art also um well um if i don't know uh... If I, I think uh, Juan that this uh, is in your question regarding that this definition is I think it's very important to define pragmatism. Uh, it's, it's not a, a thing a while is uh, is uh, all all are pragmatists in in a way that is this uh, for example the people who make a classical uh, philosophy in America in at the, at the end of the of the 19th century and the beginning are all pragmatists. No, this is not a Santa Dana is a pragmatist. No, this, this is not correct. I, I think we need a, crit a criterion, but we need the right one. The right one is not the method of truth. The right one is not the method of, of, of the, the method of meaning, um, ne 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 nor the, the theory of the, the meaning the the, 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 the a method to fix the belief uh, the the, the uh, behind this is for me an, a, 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 a specific anthropology and this is the we need to 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 reconstruct and to define clearly okay uh, we finished the, the session um, and thank you for for your effort, uh, Adriana and uh, Lucas and Ivo, and all the, the people who were uh, listening and hearing. And uh, well, thank you. Obrigado. <laughs> Obrigado. Obrigada. Obrigada, Obrigada, Professor Claudio, bueno. Laura, Juan, por favor, façam as suas considerações finais. E assim que tiver, que vocês estiverem falado, a gente interrompe a gravação. Muito obrigada. Ok, gracias. Thank you. Obrigada, acho que pode obrigado. interromper. Né?